Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Veslesh. Episode 325 for March 25th of 2016. Two hosts, four guests, and one big apple. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Ah, oh, Gary Vasilash. So here we are. New York City. Indeed. The Big Apple mm -hmm. for the car show. Yeah. No, we're here for Autoline After Hours. We get around, apparently. <laughs> apparently. <laughs> we got to tell everybody who's uh, with us today on today's show. Tim Stevens from CNET. Tim, great having you on the show. Thanks very much for having me. And we've got the car coach herself, Lauren Fix, back by popular demand. Well, thank you. Great to have you here, too. Glad to be back. So let's start out talking about the, the car show since we're here. Gary, have you so, seen anything? So, oh, okay, we're sitting in the Toyota booth, and so we, I think we ought to start and talk about the Prius Prime. So moving into a plug-in version. Now, they had a plug-in before with the right. Prius, but this is the new, the new vehicle with a plug-in. So, Tim, you are the, the tech guy. Oh, boy. No so, pressure. Uh, it's interesting, you know, with the last generation Prius, they really didn't put any muscle at all behind the plug-in. They had a plug-in version, but it was really kind of a stealth launch. They never really tried to sell it to anybody. But now this is a big launch. It's sitting right behind us, conveniently enough. They not only are putting a lot of technology in it, but they put a new nose on it and a new tail on it. The taillights are all new. It looks, we were just talking before, it looks a lot better than the uh, the outgoing Prius, or the current Prius, I guess I should say. Yeah. Um, but interestingly, it's got a lot of other new technology inside too, an 11-inch portrait display on the inside, like an iPad turned vertically, Android Auto and CarPlay in there, so you can take your smartphone and plug it in there and get all your media. A lot of great tech, and of course, 120 miles per gallon equivalent is what they're saying, and 22 miles on a charge. So. Mm -hmm. It seems like a nice nice car. They haven't told us how much it's going to cost yet, though, which I think is the big question on a lot of people's minds. Exactly. What's your take on it, Lauren? Uh, I'm not a plug-in person, as you probably know. I'm, I like gasoline-powered combustion engines. But uh, you know what? It's got one. <laughs> OK, all right, all right. Somewhere under but all that plastic, there's an engine. Somewhere right. underneath there. Yeah. I think that if you're going to buy a hybrid, it's one of the better choices that are on the market. I mean, they've sold more than any other manufacturer. Prius is a known entity. You're not buying a vehicle that you're like, well, I don't know how it's going to hold up. So I think that they've done a nice job. And technically, I, I'm, I'm a tech junkie too. I love Apple CarPlay. I love Android Auto. And I think that is something that consumers want. They're all saying, I want to be able to connect. I want to take my phone with me wherever I go. As you see all the kids glued to their hand, they can't even eat. They have to have it with them. That's right. So this is the wave of the future. Right. It's great to see the portrait-oriented display, too. That's something that Tesla kind of pioneered with the Model S. Volvo followed suit and the XC90, now the S90. And ultimately, I feel like that's a much more natural way for these displays to be oriented. Normally, we have you know the widescreen 16 by 9 display. But if you're talking navigation, it kind of cuts off the horizon. But now with the big portrait display, you can see down the road a lot further, a lot more room for media. And on Volvo, they've got the you know the screen-to-screen -screen kind of thing for CarPlay, which I think will work really nicely. So I think that's great. It's unfortunate it's an option on the Prime, you have to pay extra to get it, which is a bit of a bummer. But, but how, many, how many people who are, are really into technology even are interested in an embedded system in their vehicle versus using their phone? Yeah, it's definitely dwindling. That's one of the big, the big topics that whenever I talk to an automaker and talk about the adoption of CarPlay and Android Auto, it's the question, is this a threat to you? Is this an opportunity for you? Because you know that's a very valuable piece of real estate, the center of the dashboard. It's one of the few things you see when you're actually driving the car. And to hand that over to Apple, to hand that over to Google, that's a bit of a risky thing. Mm -hmm. But it's what consumers want for sure. I think more people are learning about millennials it. Millennials, for do. sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. I mean, I have two millennials, and they're both, right away, they're like, does it have CarPlay? Because if it doesn't, they don't want it. Yeah. And my daughter just purchased a new car, and the first thing she asked the dealer, and, it, and you'd think she'd be a car junkie like me. She wanted to know, it's got to have a manual transmission, and it has to have Apple CarPlay. And I'm like, it's a good really? Yeah. So yeah. I was, I'm thinking, that's it? To me, I want, I want there's a lot of other things that come first. Is that a first. good mix or an impossible mix? It's, it's becoming a very <laughs> well, difficult mix. Yeah. You can kind of guess <laughs> what the you manual want, part. So, yeah. 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 But what do you guys think about this plug-in? Because I was talking to some other EV advocates earlier, and they're going, what, 22 miles range? Yeah. Come on already. That's not very good. Yeah. Now, Toyota will say, well, yeah, but it's double what the old one was, which, which the EV good. people were saying, so what? 
You know, the, the Ford C-Max has had about 20, and that came out years ago, so right. why can't the latest and greatest Prius plug-in beat that by a wide margin? Yeah, that's a good point. I think, I think the big thing why people aren't buying these things the way the federal government would like us to buy them, that's how, on my perspective at least. Yeah, no, um, we agree with your perspective. Good. <laughs> and I think that they're shoving it down our throats, but I like, you know, we've got phones and we're like, do you got an outlet? Do you got an outlet? I need to plug in. Who wants to go over to your house and go, hey, Tim, I'm on my way for dinner. Do you have a cord that you can like lend me to plug in my car? Yeah, do you mind pulling your car in the garage so I can pull mine in? Yeah, yeah. I mean, seriously, I don't, I don't want to be tethered. We're already tethered with our smart devices of all forms. And the last thing I want to do is be plugging in my car too, so. I'll buy gas at $1.25 a gallon, thanks. <laughs> Hopefully it stays that way for a while. Let's, yeah. we'll can see. only hope, we yeah. can only hope. Okay, another big reveal at this show, which I have seen, is this Lincoln Navigator concept, and I'll underline concept, yeah. because it's got this gigantic gull wings, I'm not even gonna call it door, it's gull wing sides. Yeah. The whole gull side of the vehicle side. open up, and this three-step staircase unfolds. Nice. It's very dramatic. I mean, it, it, it's gonna be on every news clip, is going to show that door and the opening and the smart, stairs smart coming out. Branding. Everybody's standing back because it's so ominous as it opens up. It's such a massive edifice. It's huge. Gigantic. Mm -hmm. So you know, Model X came out, and so they all thought, you know what, we we got to do one step yeah. more. Yep. Forget just the door. We're doing the whole side. <laughs> That's how I well, see it. I mean, it's interesting that when it does open, I mean, it is it is very dramatic. I mean, it's it's majestic. I mean, that's the sort of because because not only do you have such a large piece of sheet metal going up, but the thickness of yeah, that it, it, it looks like a, a vault okay? right. and it just oh, it have comes to up. Be. but but you know it's, it's it's it strikes me that why isn't it split because that opens up the whole side so front and rear passengers uh, are because open because it's never going to go in production oh never no. ever, the steps ever, ever maybe the steps maybe nah the steps will never go in production right, maybe uh, no way. <laughs> You know, wait till they're caked with snow and ice and see how well they work That's then. And we all live back. in cold climates. Right, right. <laughs> away, absolutely. But the one good thing it does do is it gives you a nice clear view of the interior, which is really what they want to highlight. They said that it's nautically inspired. The, the Continental was inspired by personal aviation, luxury aviation. This is inspired by luxury boating. I think it should be inspired by a battleship based on the side of the thing. But, but either way. <laughs> the lanyard? You mean the lanyard? The lanyard. Yes, <laughs> like Very appropriate. But it gives you a nice view of the, you know, the 30 way adjustable seats and the quiet luxury and everything else that they want to stress about the, the comfort in the interior of that car, which which makes sense. So they can open that up and you can see everything in one shot, which is a pretty good way to do it. Okay, good so for child safety seats, though. I mean, those of us that... get in and out? Well, you still think they're going to make it that way. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> if that was actually feasible, which if we it know was it is, if it was not. feasible, that would be the best way to put kids in the back seat. It would be. All right, so, so let me ask you guys. So next year, when the production version comes out and they don't have the giant gull wing doors mm -hmm. yeah. and they may or may not have the steps. <laughs> Will they have more negative reaction as a result of not executing? Because somebody will say, well, gee whiz, Tesla's got gold wing doors. May not work well, but they have to gold wing doors. <laughs> they got a lot of problems. I mean, <laughs> is, 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 it, is, it, is it a positive or a negative? Good question. That is a good question. I don't know. I mean, I don't think that many people are really looking at the Model X and going, oh, those doors are so great, they should be on every car. I think, I think there's been so much of a story around the complexity and the cost, and, and we've seen so many videos of those doors kind of trying to close correctly it's and like not closing act. correctly. Yeah, I think, uh, I think there's been some negative reaction to those doors in the Tesla. So I don't think that the Link is going to be missing out. It yeah. does kind of take the, the attention away from the styling of the car, which may or may not be a good thing, depending upon your opinion of how it looks. I don't know that I'm the biggest fan of how it looks, but certainly it does distract away from, from the look, for the better or for the worse. Maybe the door handles that, they, that they've put on the Continental, they could put, do something like that, yep. make the front end look a little bit more stylish and sexy, if you could make a Navigator look sexy. And if they had some storage compartments that they're talking about, they just took some of those pieces they could at least try to make the production piece look. But it's a concept. When, how many concepts are in this show that we've seen that are so far from reality, we're like, yeah, so, that's so, not going to so happen. Did, did, did the Continental concept have suicide doors or did it have front hinge doors? Front hinge doors. Yeah, but they had the ones where you just touched them from underneath. Last year, yeah. that stole the show. Yeah. And this year, they did a good job stealing the show. But how do you steal a show with a navigator? <laughs> That's how they did it. You do a concept. I, I think in a year, people will not even remember what the concept car was like. Right. Yeah. And so right now, the whole idea is show off the interior, like you're saying, Tim, and also create something dramatic 
so that every local and national television news clip of this car is going to be of that giant mall opening up and the stairs spilling out. Right, absolutely. Yeah, they, I think they did that. Because I, you know, I saw the, the Rolls Royce last night and said, that's really cool, but how is that relatable to the average person on local TV? Well, I, I, can, I can't afford one of those. <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't matter. People love to dream. And, you know, we used that's to call dream them dream car. cars. That's right? a dream so, car. You know, that, that's, that's part of the magic of the automotive industry, or should be. You want to sell this magic. You want to show the people, here's the future, yeah. so that they can dream about it, and then they end up buying a Corolla or whatever. <laughs> so so is, is, is the Navigator a vehicle that Ford, that Lincoln needs to redo yes. for its portfolio, or is the current one, which was refreshed not that long ago, um, it needs a redo. Sufficient. It looks like a brick right now. I, mean, I, I actually, I was shocked when they did the last refresh. I don't know if you saw the bodywork on it when they first came out. I'm thinking they barely changed the exterior, and it looked like a brick. Yeah. In the wind, which means horrible. Drives well. Well, it's got horrible aerodynamics, at least, at least visually. Right. And I, I don't know. I'm hoping they one at least looks a lot better because the competition's really stepping up their game. Right. Well, look, if you want to step up the game with Lincoln you got to change the whole look. And they've decided that they really like the look of the Continental, especially that grill. Now they're going to start plugging it in everything. They put it on the MKZ. Now it's going on the Navigator. You know, what's left? I mean, they're going to change everything to yep. that look. I'm not a big fan of the look myself, but, you know, what I think has got nothing to do with it because the sales seem to be pretty good. You're not buying one, then. I'm not, no. <laughs> I'm not either, but that's okay. I'm a, I like the look. I'm a fan of, of the approach, though, the idea of quiet luxury, and the idea yes. that, that they're like not that. trying totally to agree. be a sports like car. They're ultimately focused on delivering a modern take on American luxury, which I think is a good thing because you know, everyone's trying to be sporty or progressive or Rather you know, than trying to make design. an M or an AMG. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're really focused on having a nice, comfortable ride, which ultimately could be a lot more appropriate as we go into this autonomous future. My, my colleague Chris Palkert wrote an editorial about how as we move in the cars that drive themselves, does this, the idea of a sports sedan kind of become irrelevant? And if so, Lincoln is positioning themselves to be in a pretty Very good, good place. Yeah. I'm totally with you on that. I totally agree. Well, well we're probably going to bifurcate the market, though. There'll yeah. be those who want to drive and those who want to be driven. Yep. Yeah, and, exactly. And so, so, they'll be, so, so Lauren, they'll, they'll have to, you know, just uh, you have to sedate, her, out of sedate her to get her hand. out of the, uh, the car. <laughs> that has a, uh, you live here in the city, right? Or you've I, got a place I in the city. I live in Buffalo and I live here, too. I do the drive a lot. Yeah. So you like driving in the city? I love driving anywhere, anywhere, everywhere. Oh, wow. In the city I will even. never, definitely not in the city. I've been in a cab accident. So when you think uh, being driven is a great thing, one cab accident, and I always wear the seatbelt anyhow, yeah. you change your whole perspective on letting someone drive you around. I don't know. When you got to wait, you know, 10 minutes just to make a left-hand turn. You can't you know. make a right on red in New York City. So. But yeah, ticket. I'd be all for autonomy in the city. Really? Yeah. Well, I can get you a car service. <laughs> be a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. I love the interior of the Navigator. I don't know if you guys took a look at that, but yeah. these gigantic consoles that they got front right. to rear. Uh, the Prindle is set up like almost like a little keyboard. In right. fact, they describe it as piano keys. I like that look. I, I think they've really done something different with the interior on the Navigator compared to all the other giant SUVs out there. All right, so how much of the interior is concept? How much of the interior will make it into production? Well, if you look at the seats, they all have what they call a pedestal mount. So instead of the seats literally being bolted to the floor, there's this sort of pedestal that the seats are on. So you got all this room underneath the seats. Which is also I borrowed don't... from the Model X, I'll point out. The Model X has that as well. So it wasn't just the going doors, the pedestal seats too. But okay. I don't think the, I don't, to Gary's question, I do not believe the pedestal mounts are going to make it. I don't know. That's going to be a NHTSA call or IAHS. I mean, if you're not. But if the, no, model, be if the model X has them, presumably they It'd need well, crash, right? But the Model X is a whole so. different animal than a mass production yeah. Ford essentially product that's going to have its. No, I think Gary's got the right, uh, the, the right question there. You know, it's all about smashing the thing into a wall in a crash test. And right. does, the, the, does <laughs> it hold up? Eh, maybe. maybe. No. Do you think they'll do it? I don't. I right, do what, not. Okay, what, what, so what about the Too Prindle? Risky. Will they do that? I think they better. I, I think, you know, to your point, you know, what if we come back in a year and we look at this vehicle and you go, mm -hmm. okay, I understand why they couldn't do the Gullwing. I understand why maybe they couldn't do the three-step stairs, but 
Dang, they better do that interior. They better have those piano keys. I mean, to me, that's the best aspect of the car is the, the interior. Yeah, I, I think agree. it's knockout good. But isn't looking at the Continental, what we saw last year, and what they actually presented to us, which was totally different in Detroit, I was shocked. I'm like, what happened to all the cool stuff? You took away the cool wheels. You took away the cool door hinges. You took, I, I, and the leather loafers in the back seat. All the cool stuff. I know, but I, then I touched the interior. It was blue. Okay, it was reminded me of an old lady's car. <laughs> I don't know. Well, let's hope that they, they're going to have to step up their game. If they're going to convince women who make 85% of the buying decisions, own 60% of the cars on the road, you better make that car family friendly. So, so do you think, Lauren, that they're trying to compete with Escalade or are they trying to compete with some other vehicle or are they trying to carve out a different space? I, I'm sure from some perspective, they're looking at Escalade and saying, that's our target. But then I'm sure there's Lexus and Infinity's got, everyone's got product as we know, that right. we've all driven them. But you know, you start looking at what's their, what their, I'm sure the main mindset in their head is Cadillac. I think you're right. Well, it dominates the segment, right? And I don't know what the profit margin on is uh, on that vehicle. I wouldn't be surprised if it's somewhere between $12,000 and $15,000 pure profit per Escalade. Lincoln's desperately got to go there. The, the refresh that they did two years ago, really didn't move the sales numbers a whole lot. Yeah. They got to do something dramatic and that's what this is about. It used to be dramatic. I had a Navigator the first year it came out. Of course, my kids were little then. They all brought friends and it was a good looking car. I mean, they had real wood. I mean, everything was really classy. When you had it, people said, wow, that made a statement. And I think it lost that, lost its way well, somehow. Look, you know, even though the Escalade dominates the segment, Navigator was the first one there. Right. right. And I remember there was a massive discussion inside Ford. Will people really buy a luxury SUV? In fact, a little interesting aside, internally it was referred to as the town truck. They had the town car, right. this was the town truck, and the big question was, and I mean, this was a raging debate, would luxury buyers buy a luxury SUV? And they got out there first, and Cadillac laughed at it until Cadillac dealers told them, you better get your ass in gear here, because we're getting our asses kicked in the marketplace. And voila, they invented the segment, and now Cadillac dominates. So, so, so what was the timing? Because they also had the luxury pickup truck, as you recall. Oh yeah, the black one. Oh, yes. So, right? so, that was, oh, that didn't go well. So, was that, was, yeah. was that was that <laughs> earlier in time or afterward? Well, here's the real question: Was it's almost the same time? I think they Very were pretty close. close. Yeah. No, it was several years after that the, the Blackwood came. That did out. not do well. I mean, you well, never you never saw them sitting in in the grocery store a lot. <laughs> yeah, but but now that you can buy a pickup truck for seventy grand, easy. You can, oh, yeah. and, and so the question I think about the Blackwood is, was, was it just a stupid idea or did they blow the launch? Remember, it was way long yeah. uh, delayed. If you remember, they had some sort of African wood on right. the side right. of it, Blackwood. and Magna was building that, that whole back thing. They had horrific quality problems in the manufacturing. I mean, Magna delivered good stuff, but they scrapped a lot of a lot of beds to, to be able to get the Lost to their run profit up. margin. So I, I think, it was, they blew the launch. When you blow a launch, man, I, I've never seen anybody recover from a Thunderbird blown launch. Thunderbird is, is my Thunderbird favorite, is a perfect favorite example. blown launch right. ever. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. It's coming. Next year you'll see, no, next year. And then when it finally showed up, we were like, oh, yeah. that's it? There's no good engine option? Okay. You know? <laughs> so Tim, do you have any sense of, of what millenn millennials or younger think of brands like Lincoln and Cadillac? Uh, I don't think that they do by and large. I mean, Cadillac definitely got a big shot in the arm thanks to uh, a lot of rappers driving around Escalades and such, and that definitely helped them a lot. But even that market is kind of shifting away from them. So I, I think a lot of millennials are looking for more practical cars at this point. And if they're looking aspirationally, they tend to be more toward the performance end of things than, than the luxury side of things. But, you know, these things change with age. And, uh, you know, as your back starts to hurt a little bit more and your, your, your clutching knee starts to get a little achy after a couple hours in traffic, then your perspectives change. Um, but yeah, I just don't think that um, that they're really looking to these cars. I think Cadillac has made some inroads with cars like the ATSV and the CTSV, um, and as those cars are now getting cheaper on the used market, I think that they're getting a little bit more appreciation from younger buyers who can now start to afford those things. But by and large, yeah, this concept of quiet luxury, I don't think really would would resonate with a um, with a millennial buyer, your average millennial buyer, anyhow. Baby boomers, I'd say. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That baby boomers would be quiet luxury. This, yeah. Where are you going to be quiet when, you've, when you're a baby boomer? you got either grandchildren or children. The car. Shut it out. <laughs> so, Tim, do you buy the argument that 
since millennials don't know all the baggage that Lincoln and Cadillac drag along with them, that they'll be more open to those brands than, say, Gen Xers or Gen Yers. Yeah, I definitely been. think so. I think so because those brands have been relatively quiet, you know, for, for a while. And so those brands, I think, have an opportunity to step forward and, and reestablish themselves. I, I do think Cadillac's doing a good job in that regard. Uh, again, I don't think that the current Lincoln messaging is going to really resonate with that audience. But I do think that there are opportunities going forward to reestablish those brands in a new way for this new generation of buyers when they get to the point where they're looking for that kind of car and, you know, in a, another 10 years or so. Uh, yeah, right now, I just don't think that they're, that's really their target. But ultimately, you know, the, the post millennials, the those those folks, the, the baby boomers, they have more money to spend anyway. So as you're looking for a high margin car, a little more expensive car, then, then that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Although it's, it, we're starting to see the shift. GM came out this week with a little factoid that really caught my uh, attention that millennials now account for, what is it, 20% of GM sales? And uh, just like five years ago, it was like 5%. Yeah. I think those numbers are right. But, you know, so we're seeing uh, millennials start to come into right. the market in a significant way. And they're coming in a bit later, but that's something that, you know, there was this belief for a long time that millennials didn't want to buy cars. There was no interest in millennials buying cars. But ultimately, we're just seeing that a lot of millennials are taking a little bit longer to find their careers to, you know, really get themselves settled in. And then once they do, they want to buy cars. Get out of their parents' else. basements. Well, a little bit of that, too. <laughs> you, you know, know. <laughs> I mean, because cause the, the two-car garage has already got mom and dad's car right. there. And it's right. like, what, what the heck? The driveway. Your average millennial... Uh, came out of college with crippling college debt, but th those that did graduate from college, into a job market that wasn't that great, to be honest with you. Economy's picking up, more jobs, more opportunities. Those college loans are getting paid down a little bit. So now, yes, they do have an opportunity to buy those cars. And it's really encouraging to see that uptick in sales because, again, everybody thought that they just didn't want cars, and everybody in here was running around screaming because they didn't know what to do. Now it's not looking so bad. Yeah. But also those drivers, I think, they didn't hear what we all heard when GM and, and, and Chrysler were going bankrupt all that stir as, as journalists right. we were on top of it every single detail yeah. they didn't hear that they were still in college or high school or maybe even middle school and now they're able to drive and they're like mom check out that you know i want to i want a chevy cruise or i want a sonic and, and we're like wow because the people of the older generation it's you know baby boomers are thinking geez i don't know there's other product out there. toyota's got some great product you know <laughs> so I, I gotta ask you lauren since since you're the motor head here okay the Nissan GTR, which uh, they took the wraps off. Oh, hey, listen, I'm from the Church of the High Lift Cam. More horsepower, better sounding <laughs> exhausts, bigger wheels, better aerodynamics. I can do that. There's a lot of product, a lot of great product here. I mean, I, I was over at the Audi booth with the R8 V10. Oh, uh, yeah. and mango orange. Beautiful, beautiful. So I like performance. The so, more, so, the merrier. So were you very happy to? I, I thought it was very interesting in the in the Nissan stand that they have the car through the ages. That's they, really they, cool. They very, and they're building very... motors. Did you see them hand building the motor? I didn't see that. There's oh, uh, four gentlemen see. from Japan. They don't speak any English at all, so they have an interpreter. And they're actually building the motor four times during the day today. Uh -huh. And they're, they're literally, you know, this is like an honor to be able to showcase if they can build it properly, they'll have the honor of hand assembling cars for the actual production vehicles. Hmm. Where, wow. You don't see that here. I mean, yeah, there, there are some cars here that have hand-built vehicles through and through. Right. But that's pretty cool. So what, what, what do they do after they assemble it? They take I'm it sure apart for the next showing? I think <laughs> I think it's being checked like it's like their test. You either make, do it under pressure with journalists standing there watching yep. them and videotaping, or you fail. So. Although I remember being in the uh, GM Performance Center and building a... Uh, a Corvette engine and uh, was it your Corvette engine? Was uh, one of the ZR1 engines? It was. It was. It was. It was. It was immediately <laughs> disassembled. I mean, it's just they the clearances the weren't there. That's it. it was, <laughs> nothing was there. But uh. yeah, you used to be able to go help assemble the engine, right? As a Corvette buyer, if yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, they, they yeah, it was like an option. Leg. It was like an eight thousand dollar option. Well, you better know what your you're doing. Engine. You get that wrong, and you have an engine issue. They're like, you built it. Yep. It's on you. Well, you know, you didn't just build it. I know. You had a tech there, and uh, you put the your hand on the torque yeah. wrench. Is it automatically torques here? Yeah, the tech like, said, done. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Give me the tool. Yeah, give me the <laughs> hand me the torque wrench. Yeah, that, that was about. Back away walk. from the torque wrench. <laughs> put the torque wrench down, sir. Yeah. The tool police are on their way, right? <laughs> So, so, Lauren, does, does cheap gas mean things like the Audi and things like the GTR are going to have better opportunities than they would, say, two or three years ago? 
You know, it's interesting. Obviously, they couldn't have predicted when they started building these cars that gas prices were going to be as low as they were. There's no, no, none of us could have predicted that. And so they are here. It does help the sales. But will it impact it when dollars are four or five dollars a gallon? You know what, people that buy those cars, and I include myself, I don't care what the cost of gasoline is. I, if I want that car and I just purchased a performance vehicle, then I'm driving it. So, you know, if you love the car, you love it. You buy the car because you love it, not because it's an investment piece, because it meets something that makes your heart pound, you know? Mm -hmm. No, I would agree with that. And, you know, besides cars like that, whether it's the R8 V10 or the Nissan GTR, it's not exactly like your everyday commuter car. I'm guessing okay. that 99% of those buyers are not going to use it to go buy a loaf of bread. You know, they're, they're <laughs> going you out put on the a loaf of bread. <laughs> yeah. right. So I don't think gas prices could affect that end. And besides, people who can afford those kinds of cars, you just peel off another 20. You know, no big deal to fill the tank. I actually had a GTR uh, tester last fall, and I took it apple picking uh, and w did a launch control demonstration to my wife and had a lot of bruised apples afterward. The GTR, not a good car to take apple picking. Was she not happy with that? Oh, she loved every second okay, of it. But uh, we, we had some apple pie because at that point the bruises don't matter. So oh, okay. she was fine. Good for applesauce. Absolutely. <laughs> so does this portend that we will continue to have cars built like that? Or, Tim, do you see that that we're going to have more technologically oriented vehicles of the nature of the Prius Prime right behind uh, I us. I think we'll definitely see a lot of that, but I, I think the encouraging thing is that we're seeing the, this this melding of minds where you can have economy and performance. You know, the new NSX is a good indicator of, even though the new NSX is getting the vast majority of its power from a twin turbo V6, a traditional right. power source, it's got that three engine hybrid system, an electric system that's in there to kind of give you an idea of where Honda wants to take that technology going forward. We're hearing talk of Subaru doing something similar, and you got to figure the next GTR is going to be doing something similar too. And so the idea would be that you could have this ridiculously high horsepower car with incredible throttle response, you know, with a flat torque curve available at zero RPM, but also go quietly to the grocery store to get your loaf of bread if you want to and burn no gasoline at all but then have you know, 700 horsepower, 800 horsepower, whatever on tap, whenever right. you want it. Uh, I think that is actually a pretty encouraging uh, vision for the future, and uh, I, I, you know, something I'm excited about. Well, it's about. interesting that you, know, you mentioned the, uh, the NSX and the hybrid system, so um, Acura showed the refresh of the MDX, right. which is now going to be available with the hybrid system and a, right. a three liter engine, and uh, was it a two motor or a three motor hybrid? I'm I think that's a two motor versus okay. the NSX, which is a three. And then they also showed off the GT3 version of the NSX in which they rip all that stuff out, just go with a good old twin turbo V6. And well, that's what I was just about to ask you guys. What do you make of that? Because that's been Ford's philosophy with the Ford GT. Right. Why do we want to lug all these batteries and heavy motors around for when we really don't need them all the time? Exactly. I, I think the problem is that they couldn't get it FIA certified with all that stuff in there. There wasn't really no way to classify that car to be a GT3 racer with all the high tech stuff. So they had to basically bring it down to a level where they could, they could go, because they wanted to go racing with it and, right. and got to love them for it, but um, but they couldn't do it with electric motors up front and a nine-speed dual-clutch transmission and all these things that aren't FIA legal. So they rip it out, they cr dial up the wick on the twin turbos and then give it a six-speed sequential and, uh, you know, slather some carbon fiber around. Go have some fun. And I can't wait to see it on the track. Yeah, that'll be fun. And speaking of transmissions, did you go see the Camaro with the 10-speed? Yeah. I'm waiting for the 20 speed. It's apparently just, <laughs> it's like one razor blade's not good enough. We'll give you five. No, wait, I have 20 razor blades. Like eventually, you know, I can imagine you guys, you know, how many razor blades. At, at some point, now, uh, Al Oppenheiser, who we choices. had on the show, yep. uh, the Camaro chief engineer, told me this morning that the 10 speed transmission ships faster than a DCT. Wow. Well, it's constantly shifting. It's like. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, when is it not shifting, I guess, is the question. Yeah, when yeah. is it not shifting? Uh -huh. Actually, they, they were bragging about that with, uh, the, is it the eight-speed that they have in uh, the Corvette, that they've got these things shifting now right. as quick or quicker than a oh, DCT. Yeah. And, and they were saying that it actually will be quicker than a person using a manual transmission. That's... Well, that's, I, that's I know you wouldn't want any part of well, that. Well, I do have, I have a vehicle that has, it has Tiptronic, yeah. uh, which tells you what I'm driving. Um, but do you use it? Never. Yeah. I drop it in sport mode and just drive it. I'm because, with you. Because why? It's an automatic. I, why I you can't ship, well, they didn't offer it in a manual, but you can't ship faster. So at this yeah. point, I mean, my race car's got manual, and that's the only way it comes. And it just gets so. frustrating, because you hit the paddle, and then you wait two seconds, and then you get the gear you want. You might as well just let it's it do it. It's true on a racetrack, though. Anytime you shift, you're losing three seconds. 
Unless you got a sequential box, you know, straight straight cut gears is what we run, but still, mm -hmm. anytime you're putting your foot in that clutch and you're shifting that gear. I have to wonder if these engineers don't wish that we didn't all hate CVTs so much because, you know, at some, we're, you know, if you think mathematically, we're approaching that limit where at some point you got to get to infinity, which is where the CVT is. Right. You, you can throw so many gears at the problem and ultimately you're just creating a, effectively a dumber CVT, but yet we all hate CVTs. And, right. Well, we enthusiasts do. I dare say right. most of the buyers who they have, have no got idea. them in yeah. their cars don't even know they have a CVT. So I wonder if, if Cor uh, Camaro engineers would rather just put a CVT in rather than continuing to try to put more gears in these automatic I think there'd be a torque issue that they'd be dealing yeah. with. Yeah, that, no. uh, not would... for enthusiast drivers. Enthusiasts, I, I don't care how good the CVT gets, I just don't see enthusiasts no. saying, yep, put that in my car. No, I don't no, see that No, but it's ever. interesting because you were saying that about CVTs and, and Tiptronics and all these type of things, but Jaguar said the heck with that. What do they've got? They've got manual transmissions. And as soon as they said that, BMW says, we're going to do that too. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and, and Audi, yes. We're, you know, so everyone's starting to offer an option of a manual because I think that when Jaguar said, we're not going to switch in the F-Type and the F-Type R, you're going to get people going, it's going to be a manual or I'm not buying it. And there are those enthusiasts. Yeah. My daughter's car is a manual. She insisted on it, so it limits your options. All right, because she's your daughter, so we understand where no, her, her name is her, Shelby. Her, my her, goodness. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So her I passion that. for that came from. But so, so my question is, is that even though they're putting manuals in some of these cars, a what will it take rate be, and b, ten years from now, if we were sitting here, will there be manual transmissions? That's a tough you, question. You talk to these manufacturers and you know they won't often say this in public, but take rates on those cars are usually three, four, or five percent for a manual transmission. And that means that they're doing it for the love and for the, the marketing aspect like much many. more so than actually making yeah. money off of it. So and, and you gotta love it for it. I mean I drive all my cars are manual as well. All my cars have always been manual and I hope to be as long as my knee holds out, I hope they continue to be. Mm -hmm. But it's just not something that I think the, the consumers by and large are looking for, and that, that is right. unfortunate. But when you've got so many other advantages of a DCT or right. a 10-speed automatic, it just gets harder and harder to make that case. It's funny because well, Mini's been really hot on manuals, so apparently that, that's a big seller for them. Gives you a street cred, at yeah. least amongst the performance crowd. Absolutely. Hey, look, we got to take a quick commercial break. We're going to come back with the second half of the show shortly, but right now we're giving a shout-out to our friends at Bridgestone. Well, we're back. We're back. We should let everybody know that we've we've made a switch here. We uh, had Tim Stevens from CNET step out and Lauren Fix, the car coach, step out. And right now we're being joined by Dan Gray from Auto Bytel and Mike Spinelli from The Drive. Great having you guys here on the show. Great to be here. Thanks for having us. So have you, have you walked this show yet, the New York show? My and feet hurt. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's we're okay. a few hours into it. My feet hurt. What stuck out in your mind? So you're always trying get there at the right time, but you're always too late to be up front. It's always the obstructed view. And I think the most striking from the obstructed view was definitely the Lincoln, mm -hmm. yeah. because it's just so out there, yeah. Yeah. different. Well, I mean, I love the New York show. I mean, it's my home show, but I, I like it because they there's always something interesting at this one. I mean, you sort of, some of the, the other, uh, you know, the, I mean, Smaller market shows, I mean, I, you know, it's sort of weird to talk about New York as a smaller market, but it is a huge market for cars, mm -hmm. but the show, you know, it's, it's not Detroit, obviously, and it's not Geneva or Frankfurt, and, but there's always something kind of cool, like there's, there's a combination of sort of interesting technology stuff and uh, performance stuff, which is kind of cool. Luxury, too, I mean, because luxury. this is a big luxury market. Yeah. So any car that... Well, you know, I mean, I obviously went right to the uh, MX-5 with the target top, obviously. Um, and it, for me, that's a car that they, I feel like they should have built because remember, I don't know if you remember the concept coupe that they did. I do. Uh, that was a while back, right? That they, maybe in the early 90s, probably maybe a couple of years after they did the original. Uh -huh. um, and just a great design that always needed to be built. And it's kind of interesting to see a car company finally get to the design that needed to be built but never was. So, so maybe Mazda has been somewhat funding constrained uh, over the past few years. And well, it, it's, it's hard to justify a coupe, I guess, right? So a coupe is always kind of a, um, I mean, a, a, like either they sell really well or they don't sell very well at all. So you have to kind of either write that off or make it a halo or kind of come, come up with another way to make money on it. Mm -hmm. or. Um, 
or you just don't do it. <laughs> and so you just decide to build the car that, that works. So did you guys did you guys go over to the Hyundai booth and see the uh, Ionic? Ionic. Yep. yep. So 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 what's so so here they're they're coming out with an EV, a plug-in, and a regular hybrid. Right. Is is this does this make sense or is this sort of a uh, a parlor I trick? I think they have to, because they'll never they'll never see the numbers on the hydrogen car. Maybe a decade from now. Mm -hmm. But in the near term. It's not an exceptional looking car. It's meant to blend in. It, no one would see that on the street and say, oh, that's a Hyundai Ionic. They would mispronounce the name. They would call it everything from Iconic I've done it many times to today. Colonic to who knows what else. But now that we cleared that. So not monumental, but they had to do it. Mm -hmm. The fact that they're saying this will be the most fuel efficient of all the hybrids, that's just throwing it out there. At, these guys, you yeah. know, because the, the Prius is remarkable, it is remarkably fuel efficient. It is under, I think it's, they were conservative when they, when they tested I it. I think you're right. I, th I think they wanted to surprise and delight owners that, yeah. you know, oh, it's yeah. rated at this, but everybody's getting two or three better miles per gallon out of it. Better to under promise and over deliver. Yeah. What's your take on those cars? Well, I mean, I think you know, other than, the, you know, the name is sort of, there's a, I'm sure there's a wrapper somewhere with a cease and desist order. Uh, <laughs> That, but I, I, you know, it's with with those technologies. I mean, it's it sort of it doesn't take a whole lot more R and D to just jam everything up together to put to mix and match the technologies to, that that might work better together. So that sort of feels to me like something that uh, is sort of it's, it doesn't doesn't add too much to the budget to just try to uh, to put the technologies uh, together in different ways. Well, Gary, what do you think about it? Well, see, I wonder, I wonder, okay, so, so someone goes into a dealership and they're presented with these three choices and then they go buy an Elantra. I mean, it's <laughs> like, right. Because, I mean, I mean it, it seems to me that it might be even overload in terms of, wow, there's so much technology here versus if you go into, say, a Toyota dealership and they basically say, okay, you can have the hybrid or you can have the one that you can get a little extra range when you plug it in. Right. And you know, no full electric one. So I mean, sort of confusing the the, the issue there a little bit. And uh, you go into a Chevy dealer, and you can, you know, at some point buy the Bolt EV, right? Or you can buy the hybrid Volt, right? Or which plug-in hybrid? Right. Yeah. We'll say. I mean, Extended range electric. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is sort of it's sort of a chicken in the basket kind of thing. It's like, do you like the wing or the thigh? I mean, what what are you going to use it for? And and. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, do you, would you make better use of the range, or would you make better use of the short, the short term, you know, sort of the city mileage kind of stuff? It's sort mm -hmm. of, it's, with the, um, the plug-in stuff, it's still infrastructure. It's just so many places the infrastructure's not there. I traveled from Princeton, on stop at the Princeton Junction train station. There are chargers there back from the from the Ranger EV days. The paddle chargers wow. they've never changed them i just took a picture of it today and and tweeted it it's ridiculous that i forgot never there was it. a ford ranger ev yeah, yeah a long time uh, ago. that goes way back oh that was back in think days remember wow that, that was think, before think before think before there's a norwegian uh like little electric the ev that i remember it from the train station in uh, white plains new york we used to have a uh, a think set up there and I, maybe there was one car that lonely think car so or as as miami steve referred to it in lily hummer that damn sewing machine. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's a very good show. Un, un, probably, uh, poorly, uh, or poorly viewed, but probably a, a show that uh, is the next step from The Sopranos to uh, Norway, I guess, somewhere. You know, besides the Ranger EV, I want to say there was a Chevy S10 EV, and I want to say that Chrysler did uh, an electric minivan. All California market, all for Zev uh, mandate. And they built very, very few of them. Most of them were destroyed, but I know a few people managed to get their hands on them. I, I, I think they might have bought them from the junkyard or something like that. But there are a few out there. Hmm. The geekiest thing you could possibly own. <laughs> it, it's unique. People are still driving the original RAV4 EVs and loving right. them. Right. Because they can, I guess. I don't know. And so, those were done by Tesla, right? Well, the new ones. The new ones were, but they oh. they did they did a, a rav oh, no, way right. way back. 
way, yeah. way back. Nissan had one too, but I can't remember what they built it off. It, it was like a Sentra or something like that. I, I want to know why all the why we don't make better use of all the Leafs that are sitting out there on the, the Leafs that have come back from lease returns. They're just sitting on lots and they're they're really inexpensive. They're huge batteries. Why can't we use them as as home battery backup systems? Instead of having a generator, you just plug your plug your Buy leaf a car, in. throw the car away, and keep the battery. <laughs> well, you can you can still drive to the market in it, but it just sits outside your house oh, to take care of the idea. take care of the outages. And I asked I asked Chelsea Sexton about it a few weeks back, and you know Nissan had been working on the technology. She said, yeah, they're still working on it, but it's in Japan. No one's brought it over here yet. Still. So how cheap can you get a used leaf for? It? Ten grand or under. That's cheap. That's real cheap. And it's probably low mileage, too. Yeah, they're lease, re they're lease turn ins. Of course, what you got to check out because they've had some battery problems on those. You got to make sure that you, you go get for CPO all the bars. One, go for CPO1, yeah. And, and your... Do they have CPO leafs? Yeah. Okay. What's interesting about the leaf, though, to me, is, uh, is that Andy Palmer, who it left the leaf program from, it was at Nissan, went over to Aston Martin and is talking about launching a, a, an all electric Aston Martin. Him being one of the only executives that successfully launched an electric car, so maybe sort of uniquely qualified to launch an Aston Martin into the Tesla range, you know, maybe with Mercedes technology, maybe, uh, maybe not. So yeah, I mean, to, as a segue, kind of going from where the Leaf as a, you know, volume car into the Aston Martin as the kind of Tesla specialty EV market. Um, where do you it's think still Aston can around. pull that off? Do you think there will be Aston Martin buyers who will go, yeah, I want the electric That's one? That's a really tricky thing because, I mean, the great thing about Tesla is that there was no brand baggage be before them. I mean, yeah, obviously, for Aston Martin, their brand is not usually baggage, but uh, in the EV market, yeah, I mean, I think they would have to really conquest sales more than uh, than convert some of their their buyers now. But but would they be financially capable of doing <laughs> that? And in with Porsche doing the Mission E, so it would seem to me that that's that that space will be filled at least for a period of time right. going forward. Tricky, tricky situation. I mean, I, you know, I don't uh, I don't doubt that Andy Palmer has uh, the financial acumen to maybe put something like that together, but whether they can get uh, some, re I mean, they would probably need to go back to the well and find some new financing for that. Mm -hmm. But they need a partner, right? Yeah, I mean, and that's it, so either you get a pile of money and you do it yourself, or you find a partner and split yeah. the cost. And since their technology partner is Mercedes, I mean, what's the likelihood Mercedes is going to say, Aston, you have the electric one. We'll continue <laughs> with our diesels. Yes. Right. <laughs> I, yeah, it's a, it's a, right. It's a tricky situation. I mean, it's a, definitely a uh, a product management issue to do. <laughs> it's sort of. Well, you know, when you look at uh, the fact that BMW is selling the powertrain to the new Karma car company, which used to be Fisker, you know, I, I would have never expected to see that, to see a BMW helping somebody who might be a competitor to their i8, i3, and whatever else the i-line goes to. So who knows, maybe Mercedes would say any incremental value, uh, incremental volume increase is all to the good in us lowering our costs, so maybe they would go with that. Right. So, so, John, yesterday afternoon you attended the J.D. Power NADA Autonomy Mobility Session. So what did you learn there and what surprised you from the presentations? Well, yeah, and it was very interesting. So they had uh, all this talk about uh, mobility, you know, the, the whole Uber, Zipcar thing. Services. Services. But they had Wall Street analysts talking about how does Wall Street take a look at it? They had regulars, regulators saying, here's how the regulators look at it. Uh, they had somebody like John Krafcheck, you know, at Google now. The one thing that he talked about, two things really stood out in my mind. Number one is every week they're doing 10 to 15,000 miles on their fleet. So they're racking up miles really fast. Every day, they're doing three million miles simulated. Wow. So when everybody says, oh, you know, how are you gonna get up all this experience? Simulation, baby. So there's that one thing. And then the other thing, somebody asked him, of course, so what are you guys gonna do, Google? Or are you going to build cars? Or are you gonna sell the technology? And he was very cagey about it, but he said one thing that really stood out in my mind. He said, you know, and I, I'm paraphrasing, I, I'm putting words in his mouth, but I'm directionally correct. 
He said, you've never flown the Boeing airline. You've never flown the Airbus airline, but you sure have flown their planes. And I think what he's drawing an analogy is that Google's not going to build the cars, but they're going to provide the mobility services, or they're going to provide you know, the autonomous mobility service, and somebody else is going to build the vehicle. So was there any sense during the discussions that since talking about mobility, which includes car sharing, um, that presumably the number of vehicles that will be sold will be reduced going forward. And I mean, and, and how did the dealer community seem to react to the notion that, gee whiz, we may be uh, watching our, our prosperity be reduced with time? That's, that's a great question because, you know, clearly this was the NADA, the National Automotive Dealers Association Conference. So nobody came out and said, whoa, you guys are toast. <laughs> They, they all sort of, you know, tried to present all this in, in the best light possible. But there's a feeling that uh, as you get to autonomous cars, as an example, you open up mobility to the elderly. You open up mobility to the disabled, to people who have a substance abuse problem, and to the very young. So the vehicle miles traveled in the future is probably going to go up a lot because you're opening up mobility to more segments of society. So we're going to see possibly just as many, if not more cars on the road than we see right now today. However, we're not going to need as many vehicles because as and you guys know the, the whole rigmarole, the average car is parked for 23 hours a day. So as you get into mobility services and flip that to where they're used 23 hours a day, not parked, uh, you don't need as many cars. But those cars are gonna be used a lot and so but their, their word to the dealers was like, don't worry too much. Car sales, and, and there was a range. Some think car sales are gonna go down a lot. Some think it's not gonna change a, a whole lot. But as you get into mobility services, who's gonna run all this? I mean, you know, you're, you're gonna have to have thousands of cars in every neighborhood. You're gonna have to have acres of land to park those cars on at night when they're not being used. You're going to have to have a, a night shift using these cars. Well, so, so there will be some night shift people, that's just true. And you're gonna have to have a string of service bays to keep these things up and in production, in, in, uh, in operation. So who's got all that? Dealers have got all that. So that's the good news for dealers. Their dealerships will be needed, but who knows? As parking we, lots? Well, uh, no, not as parking lots, but. My, dealers in my area can't find enough place to stuff all their cars. There's, they had them, like, can we put them at the airport? They have moved them all to the airport. Then the FCC came in and said, not the FCC, the FAA, uh, FAA came in and said, you can't store cars at the airport. They had to move them all out someplace else. And it's like, move, move them around. I think the whole, the whole autonomous car thing is really EVs without telling anyone about it. Because what kind of powertrain are these going to have? They're not going to run on gasoline. They're going to be electric. This is the end run around the people aren't buying electric car thing. They realized all of a sudden, hmm, we need to move EVs. How are we gonna do it? Let's call them autonomous cars. Yeah. Then people will buy EVs without buying EVs, but they won't buy them. They'll only rent them, buy them, and the <laughs> fleet will change. So the people that own the fleets will decide what the fuel is used, and the fuel largely will be electric. Although it may take long enough for it to happen, that it could be hydrogen. Well, that, that's an interesting point of, of ownership then. So does, well, will the ownership spectrum change? Will you not buy your own car? Will you buy a share in a service that, I mean, it, it sort of, it puts, it sort of throws all that stuff up in the air. So I, I guess while the number of cars may actually even go up if you start conquesting from public transportation and things like that, and the, and the actual number of cars go up, but will margins be pressed by, fleets owning most of the cars will other you know other business factors start to uh to start to crunch on that that little that the profitability that car companies and, the, and their dealer uh partners already have um will that then squeeze into another kind of business and that, that was one of the big discussions there yesterday especially amongst the analyst crowd so there was a guy uh 
who had plotted out what the cost of ownership is. And, you know, according to AAA right now, today it's 58 cents a mile. And then he, he had this descending scale that showed that if, if you get into ride sharing, you may able, be able to drop that down to around 31 cents a mile. That's a significant drop. So a lot of consumers like me, well, I'm not, I'm not gonna give up my car, car and I'm not gonna share it either, right? But for a lot of people, if you can go and say, hey, here's a new transportation model, get you everywhere you wanna go, and by the way, you're gonna save about $5,000 a year, I think you're going to have a lot of takers. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it, it depends on, uh, over time, it may become punitive to drive your own car. And in those cases, you, you know, it might become a power sport that you do on the weekends, of course. But um, yeah, it just sort of depends on, on how, uh, how the volume of, I guess it all comes down to volume, really, when, when you think about how many people will be using autonomous cars. And once that tipping point happens, how it starts to affect those like people like you who don't really want to give up their cars, but because the insurance may start going through the roof and, and you start having to be subjected to a lane where you know every other self you know sort of non self driving car has to share you know and it's like easy, and not having an easy pass right now is impossible on the East Coast, so you know it. The, the laws of unintended consequences could be fairly significant, I think, once so, that so, happens. So let me ask you this. Okay, here we are at an auto show, right? Yeah. We're seeing new cars being introduced. And, and Carlos Ghosn this morning at a breakfast said that he thinks 2020 that they're going to have fully autonomous capability, fully autonomous vehicles. Now, if we have these autonomous vehicles and you buy one, I buy into it, John I'm buys into it. I'm never buying another car in my life. Okay, <laughs> this is a hypothetical. Yeah. Okay, but I mean, so, so what becomes new. of car shows where new cars are being introduced? Is that going to become diminished as time goes on? Because basically, you'll want something that is more, say, I don't want to use the word bland, but I'll use the word bland rather than something that would be more distinctive. What happens? I, you know, I think car shows will change, but I, I think there's something about the social need of lar large numbers of people, where I think that, I think people had thought that the internet could replace everything. It could replace, well, you don't go to the bookstore anymore. Well, you don't go to, uh, to, to buy things from the supermarkets or from the large box stores anymore. Well, no, I mean, people do want to kind of get out and do things. So, yeah, I mean, maybe the car show... Um, becomes more of a technology show, and, and but I mean maybe you have a concert, that, you know, in the middle of it, or maybe there's something. Uh, like Barnes and Noble. Well, exactly. It sort of becomes more about the entertainment than about the industry itself, and then or so, sort of all that comes together. But I don't know. I mean, I think people will st still want to go and do things. So it, there might but, have. But a I mean, future. but what about the the things on display? I mean, will we continue to see the Navigator concept and and uh, GTRs and Iconics. I and think we will because you know, look, I'm a big proponent of autonomy and I'm a big proponent of this whole mobility services thing. But it's not going to go over away overnight, and there's still going to be enthusiasts like us who are going to enjoy driving a car. And maybe we don't use it for our daily commute because it's a bunch of stop and go traffic. I'm all for the autonomy in that, but. This isn't going to disappear altogether overnight. And I think people are going to want to have their own cars. And I think the public loves coming to car shows. I mean, I don't know, what's this New York show going to have? A million people come through it? I'm guessing. I don't know what the actual, I know Chicago and L.A. are a million. Detroit's about 800,000. That's just talking about the United States. You know, if you talk about Frankfurt or Paris or Shanghai, it, it's even a bigger audience. Yeah. So clearly, the public will pay money to come look at this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that's going to go away to too see, soon. To see everything that's new and to try it on, see how it fits slam the doors, kick the tires, do all that stuff, have the kids leave candy stuck in there and walk out. Right, right. But, but my point is is well, that if it becomes transportation and not well, the so boat much... Show, the boat show here does really right. well. And, you know, the motorcycle show the, uh, and, the, and the power sports show. I mean, they all sort of, they, they cater to a different kind of audience. But, I mean, if, if driving becomes more of a recre... or the recreational side of driving starts getting a little higher in the mix, maybe the show becomes something that, you know, 
you do because, hey, you know, I had a, had a, a good year and my, my tax refund came in and I can pick up that Miata or whatever it is and just, you know, my, my autonomous car will tow it to the racetrack for the weekend and, uh, and that's what I'm doing. So. I've never thought of that. An autonomous <laughs> car towing a race car. That's pretty good. Yeah, so, so, so anyway. So what comes to bread and butter cars? Yeah, Gone? Right. Bread and butter cars. Like the volume, you know, the, 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 uh, the cameras yeah, the, and the... Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the sound of crickets. Um, yeah. mm. So, so the, the big disconnect in my head is What's the number one reason people buy a car? They need to get from A to B. B being their home, uh, A being their home, B being? Wherever. Could be work, work. could be It's usually, play, it's usually work until they're retired. The majority of people that are buying cars are employed. They're buying those cars to get to work. So now, it's an autonomous car. Everybody needs to get to work between 7.30 and nine. How do we take cars off the road if we're not sharing them. So I don't see the numbers, the sales numbers dropping. And Well, the, here, here's the thought is, you know, if you're using car sharing, you could have anywhere up to 15 people sharing the same car. You know, it so takes this means me to when, work. When, when you're not driving it, someone else, someone else is, driving is driving it. it. Right. So when you don't need it. So it one car can... like a headache though. I want to use the car. I know somebody else is using it. I can't... I can't well, get it. If you're, mean, if you're sharing ownership of one piece, you know, they were, they were talking about three people jumping in to buy a car because one person couldn't afford it. Now they're going to get something that only three people can afford. I, I, so somebody works days, somebody works afternoons, and somebody works nights. But Dan, Dan the, only way, the only way this works is, again, going back to the cost. You know, if you can afford to buy a car on your own or lease a car on your own and put all the gas and insurance and all that into it and pay the 58 cents a mile that it is currently, but somebody comes around and says, hey, I'm going to charge you only 30 cents a mile and, and you're going to have a car anytime you want it, take it wherever you want to go, but you got to share with some other people. But what if I, it shows up and it doesn't smell good? Well, that's where you're going to get brand differentiation. Yeah. So if detailing you, is, is, is going to be the business to get into. Yeah. Well, you know, for six dollars sure. an hour. It, so instead of plastics, detailing. Yeah. <laughs> One word, my son, detailing. Yeah. So in a, in a luxury brand that's providing mobility services, between each use, they're going to have some sort of inspection. They're going to clean it. So when it comes to get you or you go to use it, it's pristine. And let's talk about the old people, though. I, be, you talking mom, about me again? No, I'm <laughs> right behind it. Before my mom took the ride, I was her ride. And transporting the elderly is not easy. I used to pick her up. She would love it. I'd show up in something different every, every time. And sometimes when I was out of stuff, I'd have to pick her up my S2000, which she loved riding in with the top down, 80-something years old. But I had to do the bear hug to get to her, get her out. Yeah. So, so are these cars now going to have the bear hug that'll help get grandma or grandpa out of the seat? Will there be ejector seats? Well, Will these be more expensive? Cars? But that's the There's argument for stuff. tiered, tiered services. So now we're now we're getting back to the services model of this thing, where it's like you do subscribe to the Cadillac service, where it's a Cadillac that, and, you, you're, and it's an experience, right? Because how would a car brand give up their, their, the way they think about experience? I don't think they could, and I don't think, maybe we can't either. Like, I mean, maybe the BMW shows up, and uh, you know, you, you take a longer route through the, uh, the B roads, and you know, I mean, it would probably not be great to be sitting in the back of a, of a BMW All right, so, 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 so are we talking here about just a, a normal car, like the car behind us, or are we talking about an autonomous car? Autonom a fully autonomous, okay. different experience based on whatever the brand. It will, I mean, so that, this is, these are the things that, that I think will be unlocked once the uh, once that network effect starts to happen. So, so isn't, it, isn't it possible that to address the mother problem that basically there is in the the car doesn't have seats and steering wheel and pedal and IP and so on and basically it's a space that your mother drives into on a wheelchair and locks the wheels and 
the car takes off. Right. I mean, and, and so, so the whole notion of what we think of a car to be just shifts in, in some very radical ways. And maybe that's the goal wing door. And maybe that is the goal wing door. No, yeah, no, it's the goal. And it that's starts why. to make more sense. But yeah, you know, back, back to your point, Mike, I, I think we are going to see tiers. And I think there still will be car shows so that when we go to the fully autonomous car and throw out the, uh, the steering wheel and the gas and brake pedals and uh, the, the, the shift mechanism, and, and now people are going to go in and say, who's got the coolest interior? Who, when I pull up to whatever event it is, do I have something that's really spectacular? And what's the list of services? You know, and I, I, if it's the Cadillac experience, I know I got to pay that. And if it's the Kia experience, I'm going to pay this. And I think people will still come and shop for their mobility. You know, it's not going to be the, quite the same as we got it right now, but it's not going to be all that different, I don't think. So it'll be a furniture show. It could be. <laughs> it's yeah, a lot no, like a home and garden right. show. Yeah. A home and garden show. <laughs> wow, yeah. <laughs> the steel case future. Well, and maybe this explains the head of Ford Smart Mobility. Oh, the guy from Steelcase running that. Ooh, interesting. That, I mean, it's true. And then you separate out the, the utility of it from the fun of it, and then you have the boat, your, your sports car show is your boat show, and then you have the furniture show is, or the home and garden show is the other stuff. I mean, it, it makes perfect sense in a weird future world, I think. Okay, but, but okay, so, so, okay, if we're talking about this future world, when do you think it'll happen? When do you think it'll happen? When do you think it'll happen? Um, if it starts happening in uh, 2020, I think it'll take 10 years after that. 10 so years? 20, okay, 2030. John? So for the mobility services, I think it's already started. You know, Uber delivers a million rides a day. So that's, that's already down the road. For autonomy, I think we'll see geofenced autonomous cars probably in two years time. So this is basically a gated community without the, kind of that. With, without the gates. Yeah, without the gates. Well, let's call it the, the Google campus. Mountain View, California, geofenced. That's where I think we're gonna first see autonomous cars. In the showroom, I'm gonna say 2025. So we got 2030, 2025, after I'm dead. I just hope it's like after I'm gone. It'll be nice. You're going to drop dead as soon as you step off the stage. <laughs> no, and if I do, I'll have a, a great, what's the Hunter S. Thompson quote about going over the finish line sideways with the tires screaming at the <laughs> man with the head of the ride? That's right. Yeah, so, I, so you don't want to see it. No, I don't. It's not going to be for a while. I think a lot of this is just um, drumbeat, technically possible in four years. Ford said that yesterday at, at the, their mobility luncheon. But on a city, state by state, city by city, municipality by municipality basis, years off, Uber is illegal everywhere. You go across the river to Hoboken, there are no Uber cars. You go down to Princeton Junction, there are signs, we'll, we'll take your car, we'll ticket you, we'll tow the car, you'll pay huge fines. It will take a long time for the laws to change. The technology may develop, but the laws are going to take a long time. To and you know, to your point, uh, Dan, uh, that's what the analyst community believes too. They, they're saying this is decades away. But I'd point out that the smartphone is only nine years old. Right. Google did not even start their research until just seven years ago. They didn't even put out their first autonomous Lexus until four years ago. So look how much has changed in such a short amount of time. Yeah. Now take it another seven years out from today, and the change I believe is going to be just as dramatic. We, we need to imp we need stuff like automatic braking. Everyone's jumping on that. It's going to be it's going to be good. It should be because there's way too many accidents. You know, every time you open up whatever it is you read on a local basis, there's too many. Cars need to be far more safer than they are. Autonomy is the way to do it. But people have to order those options, and they have to use them. They well, have to Toyota use them. They're going to make it uh, standard equipment uh, 2018 across the board. So, that's breaking one it. thing, but it's it's lane keep, and it's and it's adaptive stuff. People have to use it. Too many people are scared of it because they haven't had the. How do you get people to experience it? That's the that's the biggest trick, so that they trust it. That's a, that, that's a huge hurdle to overcome, it really is. And you know, with that, we're gonna have to wrap it up, but Daniel Gray, Auto I wanna you. thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, it's John. been great here. Also, uh, Mike Spinelli with The Drive, great having you here as well. 
We also have to give a shout out to the first half of the show where we had Lauren Fix, the car coach, and uh, Tim Stevens from CNET. It was great having them on the show as well. How did you let me in here? That's what I wanted. Like, yeah, just like this homeless guy, let him in. I only come for the food. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, look. This show breaks ground in every way, shape, and form. <laughs> and go. for having a homeless guy at an auto show so who's only here for the I should, I should yeah, qualify that. Yeah, th we're, we're, we're pleased to have you on the show. <laughs> so, Gary, great seeing you here in New York. So next week, let's go back to Detroit now. Why don't we do that? We'll go back to the studio. All right. Cool. Okay. want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by... Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.